Hello and welcome to Gardening Australia. This week, we're serving up gardening by the absolute truckload. So I hope you're ready. Let's get to it. I'm meeting a Thai chef who's growing subtropical plants in his Adelaide garden that remind him of home. Not a fan of mowing? Well, not a worry. I'm checking out some lawn lookalikes to help you create a no-mow sea of green. I've got a few hacks for keeping your potted garden clean and portable, on a budget, perfect for renters. And we meet an inspiring woman who's just wild about wildflowers and connecting to her local plants and Sunshine Coast community. Great line, Georgia. As gardeners, we know the amount of work that goes into making something look just right. Picture perfect. Clarence is taking us behind the scenes and into the engine room of a stunning native garden. One thing I really like to do is walk through a well-maintained display garden like this one, checking out the manicured garden beds and all of the amazing flowers putting on a big show. But have you ever thought about all of the work that goes on behind the scenes to make that happen? Well, I'm here to find out. This is Illawarra Gravillia Park Botanic Garden on the outskirts of Wollongong in the beautiful Illawarra. It's run by a team of volunteers, so it only opens to the public a few times a year. The founder is a local nurseryman and native plant expert, Ray Brown. There's about 40 acres in the whole lot. Half of it is, is all being fenced in. And then out the back, it's all, all local native forest. And one of the big things about the park is what we do is, it shows people what you can do in a garden. You know, and go home, you can come here and say, wow, wasn't that beautiful? Go home and recreate, maybe at a smaller scale, but still go home and, and sort of do it. And you can come and see how big the plants grow and what they do and how they flower. When it comes to pruning grevilleas, Ray believes in a bit of tough love. So it's time to step back and let the master get to work. A lot of gardeners do get a little bit frightened with a hard prune. These particular tropical grevilleas will take really, really heavy pruning. And pruning it back, more growing tips, more and, flowers. And it will also, too, make the plant live a lot longer. I mean, if I don't prune this within, say, five years, it's going to go scraggy. You might, you might as well dig it out. By pruning this, this will last another 10 years at least. Fairly easy to see that, that yeah. current season's growth because of last year's prune. That's right. Now, that's a haircut. <laughs> now... If I take these stubs out of here, like that, it doesn't look as though it's been dramatically pruned. If I cut that off there, and that there, it's not looking too butchered. Looking like it's had a nice haircut. <laughs> oh, muscle! And I think I'll do the same with this one over here, which won't do it any harm. Oh, shit. OK, Clarence, do you want to take off some of those over there for me, please? The very, very hard wood. Oh, no, it's it, not. It's coming in. Uh, it's got to be. There you go. This here, we can see this hardwood here. It's all shoot out here within a couple of weeks' time. Within a fortnight, you'll see little buds starting to push out. We'll have new shoots coming out. It's important to note that this pruning technique doesn't work on all grevillea species, just hybrids like this one. If you're unsure, check with your local nursery. Grevillea Park Botanic Garden is also showcasing how to graft grevilleas in innovative and often quite spectacular ways. A lot of people are familiar with hybrids and cultivars and straight species, but th this is what's known as a standard. Yes, yeah, normally a prostrate plant, and with and and in by grafting this on the top, where you can see here, this is grafted on the top of Grevillea silky oak, uh, which gets it up off the ground and it forms its umbrella shape. It shows off big plants. Not on the ground, but it, it's got a shape that's like nothing else. 
like nothing else, all right. But <laughs> you, you, and you can really clearly see the graft. It's, you it, can it's with the two too. distinct <laughs> plants, yeah. really. And this, this is around about 10, 15 year old now. To lift it up like this to get this umbrella shape is phenomenal. Isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Isn't it? This is this is still a weeping standard, but as you can see now, this is right to the ground. So it's nearly become a shrub. It's like a so big skirt. It's, that's right. <laughs> so what we're doing now, we're going to uplift, we're going to lift this skirt up. We're going to prune this from the inside out. Like most times, people cut the bottom off. That's where they think it's got to come up so they can get a skirt on it, which is wrong. With all these standards, they actually shoot out the top and come over the bottom. Once you get all the rubbish out of it, that'll rejuvenate. And it'll, it should last for 10 years. Take it out of there. And... Yeah, you can really see where the benefit of cutting it from the inside out. All the stuff that's here is really quite healthy. Just cutting the bottom really wouldn't do anything for the plant. No. But what you've done from the inside out, there's so many growing points and It's going to rejuvenate it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Planting grevilleas, yep. preparation's key. Yep. Dig the hole double the size, at least double the size, break up your soil, and then make sure the plant is is, is wet before you plant it in. One of the important things is never plant a dry plant because when you plant it in the ground, put it in the ground and water it around, the water just runs around it and it will die. Ah, uh, yes. Really, really important. Yeah. This happens a lot. Put some long-term slow-release fertiliser in there. These are water crystals. I love the water crystals. Ah, they're great. Let me tip that out. You see a lot of people with rip the bottoms out of the plant. Don't do that with grevilleas. Just plant them the way it is. Do not disturb the soil. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, really important. If the, if the soil is really, really, really dry, can you grab that? Yep. If so, just put some water in there now for a start. OK. Now, that's your bowl. Water that now. That won't need watering for another week. It's really advisable to cut a third of the plant back. A lot of people would be a little bit hesitant to I do know, that. Because it's a brand they? new plant. Yeah, brand but, new plant. But it will do it the world of good. Yes. Okay. So you're basically shaping the plant again. So we cut it off, and it wouldn't hurt to take a couple of side bits off as well. You're really consolidating the amount of energy the plant's got to That's put right. into. That's right. With a lot of new plantings, I prefer to actually come back and mulch the second wheat. You can water it again, make sure it gets water in the bowl. Yeah, yeah. And then mulch it after that. As you can see, an expert like Ray is full of great tips for caring for your grevilleas. And he's a big fan of pine bark mulch. It breathes really well, the stuff grows really well. And if you put it on at the right thickness, it doesn't thatch. When you say thatch, it's literally like a roof. It'll, it'll it seal. Roofs, and the really water won't go through yeah, yeah. and they don't breathe. This stuff breathes. I'm really, really impressed with it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing, uh, you know, some of the, the slow release that you might put in, is it probably enough for these, yeah? Yeah, well, I go through usually once a year, goes through and I'll use a slow release and just distribute it across the ground. Just just a light throw out, you know, and throw distribution. I think it just replenishes a little bit of the stuff that's leached out because of all the rain and that. And as you can see, the stuff is a lovely green colour. The next time you go to a place like Gravillia Park, spare a thought for all the care and energy that goes into keeping a display garden like this in tip-top condition for everyone to enjoy. There are times, even myself here, I'll stand here and say, wow, isn't that bloody fantastic? Which are better, tube stock like this one or more mature plants like this one? Well, they both have pros and cons. These are both the same species, by the way. Calathamnus quadrifidus or one-sided bottle brush. Now, the more mature plant, these ones give instant impact and they're also a bit more resilient when they're first planted, whereas the smaller tube stock, these are more tender. But they will establish into stronger plants fairly quickly. And that's because with these plants, there's a greater chance that the roots may have become root-bound because they've spent longer in the pot. There's also an important price difference. This one's a couple of dollars, this one's around $14. So you can afford to buy many more of these. When is the best time to take cuttings? Depends on what kind of plant you're taking the cuttings from. An evergreen plant, you wait till the spring flush is gone and then you take your cutting. 
all through the warmer months because that's the time that they'll root quite easily. With deciduous plants, it's a bit different. You take cuttings that lost their leaves, they're about the size of a biro, and that's the time to do it. If, however, you don't have exactly the right time to take the cuttings, give it a go anyway. You never know your luck. Why do some trees have needles? Well, needles are still leaves, and many conifers, like this Bribe Island pine, have really small, scale-like leaves. The size reduces evaporation. Plus, they're coated in wax, which also saves water. Now, that could be for a conifer that grows in a cold place where the water is frozen, or a hot, semi-arid region where water is always precious. But wherever they grow, they're less palatable to stock. And for that, you can thank the wax. It's pretty wet today, so it feels like a good chance to show you how water moves across this site and some of the ways you can prepare your garden for rain. There are some short-term jobs that can keep you pretty busy when you're expecting some big rain, but there's also long-term planning you can do, which is really important. G'day, Gertie. Watch your garden when it rains heavily and ask some questions. Is there water pooling in some beds and not others? If there's a slope, is the water sinking in as it flows or completely running off? Like a lot of gardens in Nipaluna, our place is pretty steep. So Anton and I have spent a lot of time over the years watching how water moves across our landscape, how the rain falls, and then we've tweaked our plan accordingly. Here are some of the structural changes that we've done. We use an excavator to terrace our steep slope to prevent water from shooting off down the hill. We also put a gentle lean on our terraces, again, just to slowly and safely move any surplus water away from our garden. And then you'll notice that all of our beds are slightly raised by two or 400 millimetres. That's just to prevent any waterlogging in times of relentless rain. And then I'm standing on this really nice wood chip pathway. Now, when we first dug out the pathway, we made them like a big open spoon drain, which is basically a shallow ditch. We then backfilled it with lots of wood chips, which does two things really nicely. It prevents any mud, and over time, it slowly breaks down, building beautiful soil in place. When we know a big rain is coming, there's a couple of short-term fixes we can do, including using a silage tarp. These are commonly used in market gardens. They're UV-stabilised, non-toxic plastic. And the idea is you place them on your empty garden beds for a range of reasons, including weed management. But I came out here last night to pop them on because I knew a big downpour was happening this morning. It's preventing any waterlogging, which can happen a lot in our heavy clay soils. And it's also reducing any leaching of nutrients away from the garden. So it's a win-win. Once the rain clears, I'm going to take this off quite soon and plant it out with the next crop. Hey, darling. Oh. The other thing I do is I've made this little hoop house here. I made it a while ago, actually, out of some 25mm blue line poly pipe. And you can have different coverings on it. You can use netting, shade cloth, and right now I've got plastic. It's a fantastic thing to do to protect crops in big rain events, but also the plastic gives a bonus of creating a warm microclimate to foster young seedlings. I don't usually invest in plastic infrastructure in my garden, but this stuff is so useful and it'll be in my garden for many years to come. Being stuck inside on a rainy day can be frustrating, but you may as well take the time and enjoy a nice, dry, quiet moment. And don't worry, that garden will still be waiting for you when the weather clears. And remember, rain softens soil. So all that weeding you've been putting off will be nice and easy to do tomorrow. Growing food in the garden is not only about what we want to eat, it's a reflection of our culture. Sophie's found a chef whose garden reflects not only his Thai background, but also his journey as a gardener in Adelaide. It's not 
not every day that I get to see subtropical plants from Thailand in an outdoor setting, but that's exactly what I'm going to see today in this modest suburban backyard in Adelaide. This garden has been transformed into a combination of experimental subtropical food plants you rarely see in this climate and some clever upcycling that makes the most of the space. The result is a garden that reflects the personality and culture of its creator, Anavat. This garden is five years old, and over that time, Anavat set about collecting subtropical food plants that remind him of his birth country, Thailand. My background is as a farmer and 1999, I landed here in Melbourne, first start as a cook. That's uh, my first land in Australia, in Melbourne. So you ended up here in Adelaide, which is a very different climate to Thailand. Yes. And you started gardening. Do you use what you grow in your cooking? Most of them is, is my own cooking. Most of them is involved in Thai ingredients. And you've got chokers. Chokers, yes. And bit of melon. bit of melon, yes. Incredibly, he's growing these plants without the aid of a greenhouse, entirely exposed to the whims of both frosty and dry and hot Adelaide climate. Anabat says this experimentation has paid off and there's been some surprises for what he's growing in this climate. So you're growing pandan? Yes, it's just like the most expensive thing that I ever heard before because this plant is like $60, but it's worth for me because it, if you go to buy in the Asian shop, only two or three leaves, it's cost you about five or six dollars. Really? Yes. So this is growing here outside without a greenhouse? Yes, but it's, it's, they're not going to survive with the frost. But what I do is in the winter time, I move in undercover. Okay. And then it's like in the spring coming, I just move it out and then let them survive. OK, and how do you use that in cooking? I make it's a lot of things. You can make dessert, you can make drink, and you can make it in, in the cooking, like pandan chicken, mm -hmm. or you make a pandan juice mm -hmm. with a young coconut, or with a dessert, you can make pandan custard or pandan ice cream. Really? Yes. Wow. Well, let's put it back and go exploring. Anavat credits his technique of hardening off subtropicals to his climate for their success. Over time, he gradually exposes new plants to more and more climate stress by slowly shifting them from sheltered inside to spending more time in their eventual destination. This way, it's not a sudden surprise when they find themselves planted in a garden in Adelaide. This is a tamarind plant. The one that you get the pods from? Yes, yes, yes. Really? I didn't know that grew in Adelaide. Do you oh. think you'll get fruiting from it? Oh, uh, I think you might but they can grow up to, to like 10 meters like, sometimes, but because the weather, this is not going anywhere, but we still can use it, uh, the young shoot, the young leaf, yep. to cooking in the soup, in Thai, really? yeah, in Thai, Thai cuisine. And what sort of flavor does it give? It's like a sour taste. How amazing. Now over here, I see you've got holy basil too. Yeah, Let's yeah, go see yeah. It. Now, this is used as a herb, but it's also a traditional medicine in many cultures, isn't it? Yes, especially in Southeast Asia. Now, in Adelaide, it can be hard to grow because of our cold winters, hard to get it through. Yes, of course. But they got two different types of uh, holy basil, mm -hmm. but this one is the strongest one that I found it. And how long does it live for then? Oh, that's about four or five years. So, really, it's about persevering yep. so you can find the variety that works in your garden. Yes, yes. And how do you use it in the kitchen? Oh, in the kitchen, I use uh, stir fry and curry. Everyone uses it in, use in salad. This is my edible bamboo. Wow, so this is uh, the bamboo old hammy eye. Yes, yes. And it's grown because it has the best flavour, is that right? Yes, because it has got the twist, uh, sweet taste. Most of the bamboo edible one, but some of them is a bitter taste. Okay. But this kind of bamboo, you don't have to boil before you cook. You just cut it and peel it and cook it straight away. It's really sweet taste. We use a day uh, curry, stir fry, or even we can make dessert some, sometimes. Really? Yes. Wow. Now, the bit that we eat is the new shoot. Yes. When do you know how to pick it? Oh, normally we leave it's about three or four weeks before we cutting, but normally it's coming up like 20 to 30 centimetre high, okay. but if too over than that, it's going to be too old to eating. 
So if you're wanting to grow this, you, you don't let it spread infinitely, but you have to leave a certain number of canes. Yes, normally you have to leave only two or three. So does it mean let them produce a new shoot easier and then produce more? Okay, so you've got more canes here, but you could use them as stakes and things like yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. That's like, this is uh, going to be another project for me. And these chilies look fantastic. Yes. Now they're a really important part of Thai cuisine. Yes, yes. Which chili are you growing here? This is called Korean chili, mm -hmm. which is like the Korean people just up the hill try up the Thailand, up mm -hmm. the north, they're using it. So this is really quite hot, but it's different texture. Okay, so when you say hot, on the scale of, in the Scoville scale that goes up to 10, mm -hmm. how hot are these ones? This is for me, it's a 10 out of the 10. Okay, so for me, they might be a lot hotter. Maybe. <laughs> I love all your recycling. You're very creative. Thank you. Annabat uses all manner of discarded items as planters. He even has pots made from old tea towels. Now you actually make them, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just from the old towel that's like, I'm not using it. So I just mix it with the cement and then turn it to the pot. So how do you get that shape? Do you have some sort of form like a bigger bucket or something? Yeah, yeah, you can get the bucket that you want to be the shape. Fabulous. Thank you. I also love your log that's over there that's planted with succulents in it. It looks fabulous. Thank you. It must make you feel pretty good to be able to grow stuff and share with others and for them to share stuff with you. That's real community. Yeah, the Thai community is very close, so we, we ha I'm happy to share and then they're happy to share with me. I'm really happy to see people just like have smile on their face and they, they go and they own food. That's better than go to buy from the shop. His garden fresh produce is an essential ingredient to his delicious Thai cooking. Annabat's garden is a testament to his passion for pushing the boundaries of his climate and the results of perseverance. It's a personal space that reflects not only his Thai culture and his skill in the kitchen, but his journey as a gardener in Adelaide. Pots, they're a great entry point for gardening. They mean you can pretty much garden anywhere, but there's some expert tips out there that can really take your container gardening to the next level. And Tammy's here with all the know-how. Oh, that smells good. can have a garden just about anywhere, thanks to pots. But a fully potted garden comes with its own challenges too, especially in courtyards or on balconies where you may have less space to work with. And if you happen to be renting, you may be more concerned about keeping the space clean and tidy. So I've got a few tricks to ease your mind and create an efficient potted garden. If you're renting, pots should be easy to move. And let's be honest, cheap. There's not much incentive to invest a lot when you know you might be on the move again soon and you don't know whether what you buy now will suit another space. It's easy to find small plastic pots, cheaply or even for free, in curbside collections and neighbourhood sharing websites. But instead of just grabbing anything, go for the bigger sizes, troughs or square pots in similar colours. Always give pots a good clean before reusing to prevent the spread of any plant diseases. Wash them with soapy water and leave them out in the sun to dry. Then give them a spray with diluted metho or eucalyptus oil to catch any remaining pathogens. If your budget allows, invest in a few of the same large pots or raised planters, even if they're plain old plastic. This means less repotting and you can simply sit smaller pots into these until you're ready to plant. Fewer, larger pots also create a solid, consistent foundation for your garden. Plastic is also much lighter too, so it's easier to move and less weight for your balcony. And if you're concerned about the weight of the soil, 
I've got a few easy ways you can fake fill your pots. The first is simple. You can reuse your small plastic pots as stands to prop up plants. Simply turn them upside down. And what if your plastic pot is just slightly too big for the decorative pot that you've got in mind? Carefully cut the rim with scissors so the plastic one can fit inside snugly and still be completely hidden. It can be tricky to get out down the track, so leave some handles. If the outer pot has drainage holes, you can place a saucer inside to keep the floor surface perfectly clean in case of drips or dirt falling out. You won't see it, so something like an old chip dinner plate is perfect. Top the pot with mulch, charcoal or coconut coir fibre to disguise your handiwork. Allowing for space between the bottom of the pot and pavers or decks can help with drainage for plants that hate wet feet and will reduce the buildup of dirt, algae and fungus that cause a yucky stain. It also allows for rain to clear out the muck or you can use a hose and sweep out underneath them. And they're easier to move because you can get both hands underneath to lift them. <laughs> Pot feet are available at most nurseries and range from cheap packs of rubber feet to little terracotta pieces you can get for a few bucks. Or you can go fancy and get ceramic or pattern ones. For an even cheaper version, try to repurpose old bricks or pavers. Just don't block the drainage holes. Also, plant caddies. They're great for solving two problems in the garden, giving height to a plant and allowing for ease of movement. If you're particularly worried about leaving behind unsightly watermarks, choose an extra large saucer that both the pot and the feet can fit within so the water doesn't flow through to the ground you will need to tip out the excess water every now and then. To help you maintain a tidy garden, it pays to have a few key tools to make your life easier. It's simple to make your own potting mat. You can use an old tarp or cut open an empty potting mix bag. It's easy to brush or wash off the dirt and takes up very little storage space. You can also overlap a couple of them if there's a hole or if you need a larger play space. Your other go-to tool? Buckets. At least two of them. These are so versatile. You can use them for watering, for potting up, to catch any dirt or drips. You can also use them to store your tools, soil, the list goes on and a decent pair of snips for harvesting, pruning, cutting open bags, plant ties, and all those other jobs. Just keep them clean with a detergent and or metho wipe down after every use. Bromeliads are perfect potted plants. There are so many varieties with different shapes, colours and patterns, and they're all fairly undemanding when it comes to care. But just make sure you give them a free draining media, like a coarse orchid bark. A few larger plants will create a cohesive look and make a big impact in a small or tricky space. And it's less to think about when you're moving. There are heaps of pot-loving plants that will create a neat wall of shrubbery as a backdrop for other bits and pieces. Here are some fabulous easy care examples that will create quick greenery in pots. And you can take them with you just about anywhere. Evergreen magnolias are fabulous trees with large, glossy green leaves and contrasting fuzzy brown undersides. The dwarf forms grow to a compact three to four metres, perfect as a standalone feature or use a few as screening plants. And don't forget to mulch. It keeps pots from drying out too quickly, which means less watering for you. And it can also help tie an assortment of pots together nicely. You can also use cypress chips for a lovely warm colour and the smell is divine. Gardening in pots can be loads of fun. It just takes some creative thinking. And the more you garden, the more tips and tricks you'll find to make any space work beautifully, wherever you are. Still to come on Gardening Australia. Jerry shows us some of his favourite unusual edibles. 
Lily does a bit of hard graft on a pistachio. And we meet a woman connecting people to the value of their protected natural areas on the Sunshine Coast. A little bit of lawn can go a long way in a garden. They're hard wearing, great for playing on, and it's been proven that even looking at a sea of green can help you relax. But not everyone has the sun or space for one, and let's face it, not everyone wants to mow. So if you want a sea of green sensation with a little less fuss, I've got you covered. Ground covered, that is. There are some common ground covers that will create a lush green scene when planted en masse. Of course, turf is the best option for high traffic areas when playing backyard cricket or picnicking. But these are perfect for places you don't plan walking on. Meet the extended family, my cousins. Well, otherwise known as Casuarina Glauca, cousin it. I mean, what a cracker of a plant. You can tell we're related because it's got these beautiful, free-flowing, needle-like branchlets that spread out and can cover a large area. So when you're planting Cousin It, you want to space it at around about a metre, and in no time, it will cover the ground for you. Now, as far as a ground cover goes, the foliage is a little more brittle. So you don't want to plant it where it's going to get trodden on. But once it's established, the foliage is so dense that it will suppress and block out weeds. Creeping Boobiella, or Myoporum parvifolium. It's a real garden go-to, an adaptable ground cover that can thrive in full sun or part shade. There's a variety of them available that vary in form and leaf size and can suit different conditions. A little tip, these boobialas can grow quickly and can cover about three metres or more. So to create your green sea, you won't need too many plants. You can also propagate them quite easily. These long running stems will root easily as cuttings or when layered from the existing parent plant. Simply strip the leaves on a small length of stem, then pin it to the ground and cover with soil. In a few months, it'll form roots, then it can be separated and planted out in another part of the garden or a little bit further around to make a perfect ground cover. If you love the feeling of walking across a lawn, I've got a few plants to share with you that can take a little traffic. If you've got a moist, shady spot, you can't go past Lobelia pedunculata or matted pratia. During spring and summer, they produce a sea of pretty white flowers. For a delicate looking plant, they're quite resilient. They can handle a light frost and they'll also cope with full sun as long as there's a bit of water around. You can plant them in your lawn to add a bit of floral bling or plant them separately and they'll slowly spread the love. They spread by suckering, which means wherever these stems touch the soil, they actually drop roots down, which helps them really establish and they can spread up to a metre. If you're a bit of a softy, then this Zoysia matrella is for you. Also known as velvet or petting grass, this ornamental grows into these fine mounds that reach about 10 centimetres. It's really slow growing, so it doesn't need mowing. Just the odd clip or trim once it's established. But it's not great in high traffic areas because it takes a long time to recover. It's ideal between pavers, at the edge of rockeries or under feature trees or on slopes that are hard to mow. Planted about 20 to 30 centimetres apart for best coverage. Once established, it can handle dry periods, humidity, light frosts, as well as full sun or part shade. 
Another ground cover that can also be used between pavers is native Dichondra reapens. It also works well in both full sun and shade. So you can grow it under trees to create a beautiful textured blanket to add interest to the ground level. Or if you've got a sunny spot, the silver grey exotic Dichondra argentea silver falls will be happier. It's more of a trailing spreader. For a more sensory experience, low growing herbs are a great option for your sea of green. They're relatively cheap, they're fast growing, they're useful, and of course, they smell great. There are many varieties of thyme that grow low and are happy in a well-drained, sunny spot. This one here is creeping thyme. It has much smaller leaves and makes for a perfect ground cover. You can even see as it spreads over the ground, it starts to drop roots. So it really establishes itself. Now, the other thing about it is that over the summer months, it gets covered in little white flowers, which is just perfect for the pollinators. There are even varieties of oregano that flower and can provide a functional and fragrant cover. Big, small, sunny, shady, in almost any garden, there's a spot where I reckon you can go with a no-mow sea of green. So why not get planting? I want to show you something that's a little bit different. So I've got a couple of pistachio trees planted here. I've got two females on the outside and a male in the middle. They need both to set a crop. And I really, really wanted to try growing them. But when I went looking for them, they were hard to find. There was only one nursery that grew them. And because they were short on stock, I actually had to buy trees that had only just recently been grafted. They weren't big, mature grafts. The rootstock is obviously really important for the bottom of a tree. It brings the nutrients up to this grafted point. But when they're young, it's also used above the graft. So it's actually drawing that nutrients past the little bud when it gets grafted to make sure it's getting everything it needs to form a really strong bond with the rootstock between the two trees. So it's been doing this for quite a bit of time. It's now old enough and it's starting to shoot away. So it's time to remove this top. If I leave it on, it'll flush out and take all of the energy. I need to take the energy out of the top and push it into that growth. This is a really important cut, so I've sharpened my secateurs for one. And the other thing to remember, whenever you're doing something like this, you need to use this fatter part of the secateur. You actually want that to be on the wood that you're going to chuck away because it'll bruise it. So I'm going just above the bud union. You can see where the bud was slipped in, almost like slipping a little collar into a T-shirt. And I'll cut away. There we go. Well, good luck, little pistachio. I've got great expectations. Jerry's always been a purveyor of the weird and wonderful, and he's never been afraid to push the limits on what you can grow in your backyard and what ends up on your plate. This time, he's introducing us to one of his favourite plant families and explains why it's a total must-have in his food garden. My food garden gives me lots of joy because I'm able to grow crops from all around the world. Today, I'm going to introduce you to some of my favourites, and many of them are considered common crops in tropical Africa. And there are over 4,000 species worldwide. If you've grown cool temperate hollyhocks or tropical hibiscus, mottled with balsa wood, eaten cacao or durian, or perhaps wear a cotton shirt, then you've already met the Malvasi family and you know just how useful they are. Let's start with one of the earliest known crops from the Malvasi family, okra. These seedlings are three weeks old and they're just ready to plant. The pods are the thing that you grow them for and they're used in curries and stir fries and as pickles. When the pods are cooked, they're soft and mucilaginous, which means the texture is somewhat slimy, rather like a canned peach. Okra has a reputation for having seed which are tricky to germinate, but I found a technique which works really well and it's equally useful for other tropical members of the Malvasi family. 
I sow the seed in ordinary seed raising mix and then I cover the seed lightly with vermiculite. That conserves moisture and it allows a little bit of the sun's warmth through as well. I stand the pot into a saucer and I keep water in the saucer all the time. And black pots, they soak up the sun. Germination is rapid and very even. Now you can save the seed from one year to another in a packet like this. At room temperature, they'll be fine. But if you want longer term storage, put them in a sealed jar in the fridge and they'll store fine for three years. After that, the germination falls rapidly away. So I'm going to plant the okra in this little block. I've prepared a seed bed in the normal way. I've dug the soil and raked it level, but I normally add compost at that stage. But for okra and other related crops, I found a tip that works really well. You spread a layer of compost over the surface and then plant through it. Now, the reason this works better than just mixing the compost into the soil is because the hibiscus have surface feeding roots. They don't go down very deep. And this really helps to conserve moisture and help the plants grow well. I'm planting them about 45 centimetres apart. That is a little bit tight, but that allows me to hedge my bets. Just in case I miss a few caterpillars, and one or two plants disappear, the rest will fill in and I'll still get my food. Finally, I'm adding some fertiliser before watering in. Before you all call Media Watch, this is not what it first appears to be. This is Kanaf, and it's entirely legal to have it in your garden. I grow it for the edible flowers and the young leaves, which are also edible. But it's also grown for the fibre, which is used to make rope, paper and cloth. Now, you'll notice I've sown these seed very closely together too closely to easily remove by normal means. So I've got a little bit of a trick which ensures that the seedlings come out in perfect condition. Just take them out from the pot and then in this bowl of water, all you have to do is a jiggle. All you need is a very gentle little jiggle and look at that. So you've got a perfect little seedling. They can plant those out direct, and water them well, or they can be grown on to a larger stage in a pot and then planted out. Another important member of the Malvasi family is jute. Jute is used for a variety of purposes, including twine and making hessian sacks like this. But it's second only to cotton in the industrial scale with which it's grown. I grow it in my garden for the edible leaves, which are quite tasty, the flowers too, and it produces little pods. And that's a little known secret, that the pods, when they're young, are quite tasty in stir fries and they can be pickled like capers. Now, next to it, I've got white jute, and that's a very closely related plant to the common jute. You can eat the pods and the leaves in just the same way. And of course, if you want fibre, pack the plants in very close together. It's really important to force that growth into long stems, which produce really useful long fibres. The last example of Malvasi that I grow in my garden is this, the native rosella. It's a short-lived perennial. The petals are edible. The flowers can be made into a syrupy tea, which is really great for relieving an irritating cough or a sore throat. The leaves can be cooked like spinach, but the traditional food is the taproot, which grows a bit like a white carrot, and that can be roasted and cooked and eaten like a staple. Malvasi examples like these are versatile, tasty and easy to grow. They're dependable crops and 
they'll put fibre in your diet. And you never know, if you grow enough of them, you might have enough fibre to start making your own clothes. Protected conservation areas have a long, rich history in Australia. They're part of who we are. And so many of you would have strong memories of a special one near you. Our next story is about a woman connecting to her local area and the plants within it. And she's taking plenty of others along for the ride. I've been on a journey which has really been about getting to know country, getting to know place, the land, the landscape, the flowers, the things that grow here. And that's been through the stories of women who lived here in the past and the contributions they made. And now it's about passing on some of that knowledge that I've been fortunate to accumulate to others. I draw on my backgrounds as a teacher, an educator, a researcher, a writer, an artist, and a lover of nature and the environment. I call myself a curator, curator of experiences. I'm Sue Davis, and I'm a wildflower woman. I love our local native wildflowers, but it's also about the history and the stories that relate to the wildflowers and the places where they grow. This place is special to me because it's one of my happy places. Kathleen MacArthur Conservation Park, named after a woman who was a really significant early activist, environmentalist, and also artist. It's my go-to place for solace, for inspiration. And that's largely because of the plants that grow here. Many of them are wildflowering plants. Kathleen MacArthur came from quite a privileged background. And I think perhaps it gave her the confidence to believe that her voice should be listened to. And I think for many women in the 20th century, that was very difficult. She bought a house at Caloundra and that house she named Midjum after the sandberry that grows there. She really found her passion then in the 1950s through painting, documenting, and then writing about the local wildflowers and the special habitats and ecologies on the Sunshine Coast. A really important friendship in her life was the one that she forged with the poet Judith Wright. It wasn't till the 1960s that then they became early conservationists and formed the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland, which still operates today. And they started Wildlife Magazine. And once again, that's still published today. So it became the vehicle for a whole series of then campaigns across a number of issues. You can't mine the sand without taking the trees, as this area here shows and the council used its town plan to stop the company from touching the red gums. One of the early ones that Kathleen and Judith were involved in was the start of the Kalula campaign. The large areas of the territory from north of Noosa up to Rainbow Beach, that was all being slated for sand mining. There was also a pastoral lease pending. So when they found that out, that's when they went this area must be saved. There's all these high dunes, really significant habitats. And part of the challenge really for the campaign was that nobody knew what Kalula was or where it was. So the fight to establish Kalula as a national park was one of the first that used a postcard campaign. And Kathleen MacArthur was the brains behind that. Printing 100,000 postcards and a brochure encouraging people to send these postcards and inundate the Premier with a demand that Kalula must be saved. So it's because of the activism of these women that we have national parks and reserves that we can appreciate today. This reserve is a little bit under 100 acres and it's just on the northern side of Lake Karamundi. So in days gone by, this was wildflower heathlands from here up to Kiwana. 
So now this is the only patch that's left in this area. That's why it's really quite special for the Sunshine Coast. It features both dry heath and wet heath and also some woodlands on the edges. There's really quite a, a rich diversity of plant life to be found here. This is the only patch of the Wollombanksias that's in this reserve. And to me, it's almost like coming home. So I always like to come and greet them. And it's like greeting old friends. When first I knew this forest, its flowers were strange. Their different forms and faces changed with the seasons change. White violets smudged with purple, the wild ginger spray, ground orchids, small and single, haunted my day. For me, that first verse of Judith Wright's poem really expresses how I felt about the wildflowers when I first started this journey. I had no idea. I'd read all these lists of names and I, I had no pictures in my head for what they looked like. None of these flowers I could envision. So that really does encapsulate my journey. There's different ways that people can come to know plants and wildflowers, and one of them is through art and through drawing. So it's a way of seeing. If you look carefully at a flower and if you're drawing it, you'll never forget that flower. And you actually forge a relationship with it and they become like your friends. <laughs> I've met a range of artists and designers, some of whom um, really focus on our Australian wildflowers and, and plants. I haven't drawn in a dosa before. No, I haven't either. Might be Marnie Stewart is a local surface designer, so she creates designs and patterns that are then transferred to fabrics, to wallpaper, to all sorts of products. This is the Wollombanksia here, and you can see it in the repeat, just here. And so this is one of the areas that Marnie likes to come to and seeks inspiration from. I'm inspired by the strange joy of the wildflowers. Every time I visit, it's different. They're beautiful, they pop out with a different colour or a different shape, and each time it's a new visit, so it's never-ending inspiration. Yeah, so the Nadoza is on show at the moment, and this little darling here which is the showy guinea flower. So the walks I host are open to anyone. And when we come out here, you'll see there's actually heaps of it over here. It really is nature's garden. It's about encouraging people to find out about their own local areas, finding out about the plants, the ecologies that were here, that might still be here, about appreciating those. Oh yeah, well spotted, well spotted, yeah. And I guess I'm really keen on people exploring different ways to come to know them. Not everyone needs to be a botanist. You can find a love of nature through art, through poetry, um, through just going for a walk with friends. I feel fortunate now that I've become a custodian of some of this knowledge, both from traditional owners, from people like Kathleen and others, and so for me, it's become, I guess, part of my mission to share that love, that joy with others. In cool areas, keep polyanthus pumping by adding a liquid feed high in potassium to the watering can each fortnight. Snip dead material as needed and keep in part shade for profuse flowering. Balance your beans with support structures to keep them on the straight and narrow. Get creative with bamboo, string, stakes or trellises to support the incoming harvest. Parsnips will taste extra good if harvested now, but if you're saving seed, keep some of the best looking plants in the ground. In warm temperate areas, rhubarb crowns can be planted into fertile soils now. If you have a patch already, get out a spade to divide and multiply by slicing between each new shoot. Look out for any disease materials before spring hits and dispose of them in plastic bags for general waste. Avoid getting disease into your compost or green bin 
to help stop the spread. Prep beds now for your warmer crops by improving the soil with some aeration, manure and mulch. In subtropical areas, now's the time to tidy up wind-torn, tattered plants. Cordyline leaves can be pulled away gently from the trunk and torn strelitzia leaves cut at the base to encourage new growth. Extend the flowering season of Giranta garden cultivars by pruning branch tips. As the weather warms and plants put on new growth, this haircut will give it a brighter and bushier look. Prune hibiscus trees now to stop the erinose mite in its tracks. This will give soft new shoots time to harden off before the mite comes out of dormancy and does any damage. In tropical areas, dry winds are picking up, so it's time to increase your irrigation timer. Look out for dry spots and apply a dose of organic wetting agent to maintain hydration on plants about to sprout. Jackfruit's in the ring. It's a heavyweight in flavour, but can also be dangerous as it drops. Harvest safely as soon as they're ripe. A dull thud sound when the fruit is tapped indicates its readiness. Mediterranean-like herbs such as oregano, sage and thyme can be harvested now before the humidity hits. Or try Cuban oregano, Coleus amboinicus, which will love a tropical lifestyle. In arid areas, keep an eye out for the Darling River Rose that's in bloom now. This attractive Aussie has hibiscus-like flowers and is the floral emblem of the NT. You'll see it growing in dry creek beds and rocky slopes, or better still, plant one in your garden. Mulberries are beginning to come out of their dormancy and are ready for a good drink. Feed with blood and bone and keep soil moisture even as they put on new growth. Prepare certified seed potatoes now to get a head start. Pop spuds on a windowsill with eyes pointing up and plant out when sprouts are two centimetres long or as soon as the soil becomes workable. You've got a great weekend ahead of you in the garden and when it's time for Tools Down, catch up with us on iView to inspire your next project. Well, it's over for another week, but we've still got plenty of stories from the garden to share. I'll see you next time for even more. I'm visiting a bushland oasis. It's only a stone's throw from the CBD, and it was once a quarry and a landfill tip. And I'm going to meet the people who've helped transform it. I'm going to show you the best growing technique to successfully transform your flowers into delicious fruit. And vertical gardens can transform a small space or wall in your garden. And the good news is they're easy to make yourself at home. I'll show you how.